Thanks everyone for joining us today. As Margie said, uh, this is the session on spatial analysis in ArcGIS Online, an introduction. My name is Bonnie Steyer, and joining me today is my colleague, Stuart Penninger, and we're both solution engineers on Esri's national government team. So I wanted to start with this Chinese proverb. He who asks a question remains a fool for five minutes. He who does not ask remains a fool forever. And spatial, spatial analysis is all about asking questions of our data. And with ArcGIS Online, it's easier than ever for anyone to be able to ask these types of questions and get answers so that no one needs to remain a fool. Using spatial analysis in ArcGIS Online, you don't need any specialized thick client installed software or an advanced degree in GIS. It's accessible right through your web browser in an easy to use interface. And while we're focusing this session on the ArcGIS Online interface, behind the scenes, we're really talking about a set of geoprocessing web services that are accessible throughout the ArcGIS platform. So in addition to the online map viewer, the, the classic interface as we might call it, um, as opposed to the online uh, map viewer beta, if some of you have been working with that, the tools are not available in that beta viewer yet. They will be coming, uh, but they're certainly available in the classic viewer. Um, we have that same map viewer experience in ArcGIS Enterprise. So your enterprise administrator can configure uh, these tools to be used within your enterprise, enterprise deployment as well. Uh, also, we can expose these tools through ArcGIS Web App Builder. Um, so that can extend the reach of these tools to an even wider audience uh, through your configured applications. They're also accessible through ArcGIS Pro. Uh, as long as you're connected to your ArcGIS Online subscription, they'll be in that ready to use tools menu. And because they're web services, we can also access them through our APIs. So our, our REST API, uh, as well as Python and JavaScript APIs, so you can incorporate these tools into your custom scripts and web applications. But as we said, we're gonna be focusing today on the ArcGIS Online interface. So what are the requirements to be able to use these tools in ArcGIS Online? Well, obviously you need a subscription. Uh, then you need to have a creator user type and a publisher role or a custom role that has certain privileges granted to it. And I've highlighted those privileges in these screenshots. So your custom role needs to be able to own content, publish hosted feature layers, since all of the results of our analysis are created as hosted feature layers. And then you need to, depending on the type of analysis that you're gonna be doing, um, have privileges for network analysis, spatial analysis, and geo enrichment. Um, if you're not going to be using, you know, for example, geo-enrichment, then obviously you wouldn't need that, that permission. Um, so it's up to your administrator um, to configure that custom role and assign it to you. Um, and then we also need to have credits uh, allocated. So if your organization is allocating credits to people, um, then, you know, you need to do some planning to understand how many credits that you might need as an analyst um, to run the tools um, that you need to run. And so what tools are available in ArcGIS Online? Uh, for any of you that have worked with our desktop uh, environments, either ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap, um, we, we group these tools in two categories, or in the, in the parlance of desktop, we would call them tool sets. Um, now obviously there's you know, many hundreds of tools available in those desktop environments. We have a subset of those available within the online environment. Um, but we won't have time to talk through every one of these tools. There's, there's almost 30 of them. Um, so I'm gonna highlight the main concepts for each category. Really what we've done is taken the tools that um, you know, are designed to address the most common geospatial analysis workflows. So the first category is summarized data. And this is all about calculating counts, lengths, areas, and other statistics about our features and their attributes, either within an area or near some other features. And so the you know, easy example here is aggregating data, a very common GIS workflow, right, to, to summarize points within a, uh, a polygon area, right? Um, but notice there's also the join features as well, is a very common uh, process that's uh, available in the summarized data toolset. 
The next category is about finding locations. And this is all about identifying or creating features that meet some sort of criteria. Um, so again, the desktop analogy uh, might be doing a, a spatial or attribute query through that, you know, select by location or select by attribute. Um, we're, you know, setting up some sort of criteria there. Uh, we might be looking for locations that satisfy a demand. Um, as well as visible areas from a specified height. So taking into account elevation um, for visible areas, as well as uh, for looking at downstream areas for drainage points. Again, taking that um, elevation data into account. Uh, the third category is really just one tool uh, on data enrichment. And this allows us to explore demographic, lifestyle, business, and even landscape data for any area of our choosing. As you can see in the little animation, uh, there's you know, many categories of data with many variables under each category, certainly for the US. Um, but we also have data internationally as well. Next up is analyzing patterns. And this is about identifying, quantifying, and visualizing those spatial patterns in your data. So think of cluster analysis, finding statistically significant features, or estimating values for data that we don't have um, in a certain area based on uh, existing values that we do have. Using proximity is all about answering questions like what is near what? So um, in addition to doing basic buffering, this incorporates a lot of that network analysis. If you're familiar with network analysis, taking into account some sort of transportation network to measure travel time or distance and um, intelligently route from one point to another or one point to many points, uh, et cetera. So um, using that um, you know, street network data to help uh, with an intelligent analysis. And then finally, manage data. And as the name implies, this is all about that day-to-day -day management of data. And a, a lot of times you, you use these tools um, prior to some other analysis where you need to combine some data. For example, you may need to dissolve boundaries on a polygon layer before you do an aggregation of points to it, right? Um, notice also this has an extract data tool. So if you need to work with your data in another format, bring it into another part of the platform, um, you can extract data using that tool as well. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the analysis workflow. And really, this isn't terribly different than um, how you would approach an analysis in, in any part of the platform. Um, we'll follow these same basic sort of steps, right, where we're first we need to prepare our data. We need to understand what data we um, need for our analysis. We bring that data into our visualization environment, our map. Uh, we actually run a tool, perform some sort of analysis review the results, did we answer the question we set out to answer, and then optionally rerun that analysis, right? Sometimes this is an iterative process um, where we go back and, and repeat our analysis. So I'm gonna talk through each of these steps in a little more detail, um, specific to, to how we work with it in ArcGIS Online. So in the prepare data step, right, this is assembling all the data that we need for our analysis. So based on the question that you're setting out to ask, uh, or setting out to answer, um, what data sets do you need and where can you find them, right? It might be data that you maintain or your organization maintains locally, um, or it might be something that you've already published online. It might be um, some external data source uh, that you download data from, and uh, then you need to bring that into your environment, um, you know, and combine it with, you know, a lot of other data sources, either local or online, right? So. Um, it could be existing web layers or it could be uh, sort of raw data that you need to publish and turn into um, a spatial layer. Um, so then that step of, of creating uh, layers, whether that's, you know, drag and dropping a CSV or, or publishing is sort of that, that next step um, once we you know, gathered all those data sources. In terms of the ArcGIS Online interface, these are the supported data types. Um, so the obvious ones that, that you might uh, immediately go to, things like feature services and map services are here. Um, but some other ones that you may not realize you can work with are things like map notes or a CSV file that you, you bring into the map interface, uh, KML layers, WFS layers, et cetera. So these are the same um, in ArcGIS Online as well as the Enterprise Map Viewer. So um, the list holds for both. 
So now we bring that data into our, our mapping environment, right? So this means bringing it into the ArcGIS Online Map Viewer. Now I've added an asterisk here because uh, a lot of the analysis tools in ArcGIS Online actually do allow you to browse to layers from within the tool dialog. So you don't technically need to add that data to the map ahead of time. Um, you can browse out, for example, to Living Atlas layers or to a layer in your content. Um, so that, that works for, again, things that are published as, as feature layers or map services um, or things that are uh, you know, cataloged as web layers already in ArcGIS Online. Obviously, if you were bringing in some local data source, um, that breaks down. You need to go another pathway to get that into your map viewer, whether that's, again, publishing it as a feature service first or dragging and dropping it into the map viewer or adding your map notes, um, depending on the type of data it is. Uh, but regardless, you may want to bring your data into the interface anyways, um, either to set symbology, because you're going to use it in a visualization later. Um, you may need to explore the attributes. So you need to understand a little bit more about what's available in that data set um, to know what uh, parameters you're going to use those various fields in. Um, you may need to set an extent for your analysis optionally filtering the data, right? You may not need to, to um, analyze all of it um, or set up bookmarks again for another visualization. Um, and then obviously, if you're gonna continue using that map in the future, you'll wanna save that map while you're, while you're working with it. So then we actually perform our analysis, right? So this means um, accessing those analysis tools. And there's a couple different ways that we can do that in the online interface. There's the analysis button, which is right next to the base map button at the top of that left-hand panel. Um, also, you'll see a little button underneath each layer. Um, so any layer that can be used in an analysis will have um, this uh, kind of fifth button. Uh, with the little analysis icon, and that will launch the tools as well, assuming that you're using that layer as one of the inputs, right? Um, once you open the tool dialog, you know, there's several categories, as we said, and several tools underneath. Um, so obviously, you, you may have some experience with them. You may know exactly what tool you want to use, but in some cases, you may need to um, understand a little bit more about them before you choose the appropriate tool. So we've included these informational pop-ups uh, for each one. They have that little blue eye icon, and this will give you a nice, um, easy to understand description of each of these tools um, to make it really easy to choose which one is appropriate for your analysis. And then once you've chosen your tool, you're taken into the dialog where you apply your different parameters. And you'll notice the little information icon appears on the side of each of those parameters as well along the right hand side. So each parameter also has those little information windows to describe what uh, is meant to go into that parameter. Um, so some of these parameters will be, um, you know, auto-populated, the tool will make an assumption about what information you want to use in each, um, but you obviously can change those. And some of the parameters are optional, right? So a lot of those tools have optional uh, choices um, that you may or may not want to include depending on the question that you're asking, right? So then once you've run your tool, you need to review the results. This is where you decide if you've actually answered your analysis question. Um, so that output that's created from each tool will be a hosted feature service, the exception being the extract data, if you're extracting into some other format. Um, and then those results get added to your web map automatically, so you don't have to go searching for them. And you know, once you've uh, got that result, it's up to you whether you're gonna um, use that in some, some further visualization, in which case you're gonna configure those result layers, um, you know, configure the pop-ups, configure the symbology, and choose how they're gonna be shared out to the, to the audience, right? Not all analyses need to have a visualization. However, you may just be needing to answer a question and, and move on from there. But of course, we love maps, so um, the visualizations obviously are a common next step for, for most of us. And if you haven't answered your analysis question, this is where you rerun that analysis. And we've uh, added some improvements recently to allow you to make it easier to do this, right? So on those result layers, anything that's a result of your analysis, you'll see a little icon underneath it uh, with a little blue arrow for rerunning the analysis. And this will open up the same tool that was run to create that output uh, with all the previous parameters uh, already uh, populated in there. 
And so maybe you're rerunning it on the same data, um, just with a you know change in parameter. You're trying to um, explore you know how the results differ if you change a parameter slightly. Um, or you may need to rerun the exact same analysis because the data behind it has changed. If you're say connected to um, some data source that's being updated, maybe it's you know a feature service that's being updated in the field, um, and you're getting new data or changing attributes of the data, um, you may need to rerun the analysis on that updated data. So you can easily do that um, with this rerun option. So we've walked through the uh, types of tools we have and the common workflow that you take for, for running with them. Um, so now we're gonna go into some demos. I'm gonna show a first demo here on um, reporting metrics on shootings, and then I'll be turning it over to Stuart to walk us through some more examples. So in this first scenario, um, you know, the scenario that we would set up is that there's been an, an uptick in shootings near schools in Baltimore, Maryland. And the mayor needs to know some basic metrics and uh, which schools are most affected so the police department can shift resources. So we wanna uh, answer the following questions. We wanna know how many shootings happened within 500 meters of schools, which school had the most shootings nearby, and how many shootings happened within 500 meters of that school. And then finally, we wanna create a report with a map of that top school and the nearby shootings and include a list with the details of those shootings. So we wanna answer some questions. We also wanna have um, some output reports. So I'm gonna jump out to ArcGIS Online. I've got a map set up around Baltimore. And again, the first step in my analysis is based on the question that I'm asking, what are the data layers that I'm gonna need? So I'm asking questions about shootings near schools. So obviously I'm gonna need data on schools and I'm gonna need data on shootings. Um, so one of the you know, common resources for data is ArcGIS Online itself. So you can browse for um, or search for layers within your own organization or public layers that have, have been shared in ArcGIS Online. Um, but we also always recommend starting with the Living Atlas um, with this curated set of data that um, uh, Esri has kind of uh, put their stamp of approval on. So I'm gonna look for public schools in the Living Atlas. I find some results here, this top one being shared by the, the Geo Platform folks. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that one into my map. And you can see they're you know, all across the country. Um, I really don't need all of the schools, so to help me focus my analysis, the first thing I'm gonna do is filter this down a bit and at least um, get it down to the state of Maryland. So I'm gonna set up a filter where the state is Maryland. All right, next I need some data on shootings in Baltimore. Um, so again, I could search ArcGIS Online for this, uh, but another common uh, way of getting data is looking at open data pages. Um, so I actually went and found an open data site for Baltimore and downloaded a uh, CSV of shooting data. Um, and so this comes along with XY coordinates, which is great, it's ready to map. So that makes it very easy for me to bring it into my ArcGIS Online interface. I could take the CSV and you know, drag and drop it, or in this case, I've already uploaded it into my ArcGIS Online uh, account and have it here as a layer ready to go. So I'm just gonna turn on that shootings layer and we'll see those red dots nearby these schools. I'll zoom in a bit. All right, so to answer my first question, uh, how many shootings have occurred within 500 meters of these schools? I'm gonna open my analysis tools. I'll use the analysis button up here. And I'm asking, you know, how many? So this is a kind of quantitative question. Um, so I'm thinking summarizing data is gonna be a good place to start. And again, if I'm not sure which one of these is the best tool to use, um, I can click the information pop up here get that description, uh, this summarize nearby, finds features that are within a specified distance of features in the input layer. That sounds exactly like what I need to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose that tool. And I'm taken into the dialog where again, there's um, you know step-by-step -step, um, <clears throat> flow here to, to fill out my parameters. So first I'm choosing the layer from which the distances will be measured to features in the layer to summarize. So I'm measuring from my schools, right? I'm 500 meters around my schools. 
So it's already, again, made an intelligent choice based on the layers in my map, uh, but I could change this if I needed to. Or again, I can browse out to another analysis layer that's not already in my map. And then the layer that I'm summarizing is those Baltimore shootings. Again, I could change that if needed. And I'm gonna summarize using line distance. Notice in here we could take a transportation network into account, um, but for today I'm just gonna do a simple line distance of 500 meters. And I will leave the option here to return those bounding areas for context. And then I have some other optional parameters, right? If there's some other statistic about the shootings that I wanted to summarize, I could do that. Um, it will automatically you know, count the number of, of points or shootings in this case. Uh, but there's nothing else really that I need to, to summarize. I don't need to group it by any sort of category. Um, so I can skip those two parameters. Always we wanna give a, an intelligent output name for our uh, result layer. So I might call this school summary. And then I can choose to put this into a particular folder in my uh, content. Um, I can use the current map extent if I know that my current map extent incorporates all the data that I wanna analyze. Um, I can you know, be safe and uncheck that and make sure I'm analyzing all of my crimes or all of my shootings. Um, or I can zoom out to an extent where I know I'm seeing all my uh, shooting points in schools and then I can limit that. Um, so just think about that as you're um, setting up your extents in your map. Um, and then I can show credits as well so I can understand how many credits this analysis is going to consume. I would run this analysis and for today's webinar, we're not gonna run these live uh, for the sake of time. I'm gonna step back into my content view and show you what that output would look like. So I'm gonna turn on my school summary layer and I'll turn off the schools themselves so we can see this a little bit more clearly. So you can see the bounding areas is these circles and then the center dots are sized by that count of points, right? So to answer my first question, um, I really wanna you know, summarize within all of these, which I can do just by looking at the table. So I'm gonna open the table for this result layer and on the count of points, I just wanna know the total for these. So I can click on that uh, column title and go to statistics and I see uh, 691 total, um, total count. So that answers my first question. There are 691 shootings within 500 meters of these schools. The second question was which school had the highest number of shootings? Um, so I can answer that simply by sorting on this field. So I'll sort descending and this top school is New Song Academy, which notice when I select it in the table, it's highlighted for me on the map. And the third question was how many uh, shootings took place within 500 meters of the school? That's obviously just the count of points at 18. So we've answered our three questions, which is great. Um, the next step was to create some of that um, content for our report. So I wanna create a map with just this school uh, being the, the one most impacted by these shootings. And I wanna show you know, the, the area around it with, with the shootings in that area. And then I wanna export the list of those shootings. So to do that, I'm gonna run some more tools to help prepare that content. I wanna focus my map just on the New Song Academy um, so I'm gonna just do, start by doing a filter on this result. So I'm gonna just go in and filter based on the name of the school. Oops. Oops. New Song Academy. All right, so that shows just that school. Now it's narrowed down very easily. Now I just wanna show the shootings within this uh, 500 meter buffer. Um, unfortunately, that's not just an easy filter because we're comparing it to another data set. This is actually gonna be doing um, a spatial query. So to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and use my analysis tools again. And I'm trying to find uh, you know, features that meet some criteria. So as I said, that's gonna be our find locations uh, tool set category. And I'm gonna use the first tool because I'm selecting from our existing locations. I don't need to derive any, any new features. Um, so the layer that I want to uh, select from is not actually the schools layer, it's the shootings layer. So I'll change that drop down, And then I hit add expression to begin building that spatial query. 
by default, it's doing an attribute query. So I'll just change this drop down to the spatial query that I want to use. So I want to say, you know, where it intersects the um, uh, school summary layer that I filtered. So the, this is the layer that has been filtered to just show that single bounding area, that single school. So I only want to find the shootings that intersect it. So I'll go ahead and add that. Again, we can rename our output layer, choose to use the current extent, uh, show credits, etc. I'll go ahead and back out and show you the results. And that is just the shootings near new song. Let me turn that off. There we go. So now I have my focused map um, just on the New Song Academy and it's surrounding uh, the nearby shootings. So now the last step is to uh, export out the list of these shootings. Um, so I don't want the whole thing, I just want um, these 18 that have been, um, that are falling within the 500 meters. So that uh, is a you know, simple tool to use in our data management um, category. In this case, I'm going to open the analysis tools using the perform analysis icon underneath my layer itself, just to show you that that works. It goes back to the same dialog. Um, using manage data, I'll use extract data, uh, make sure I have the right layer selected, which again, based on launching this from the layer itself, it's made that selection for me. And then um, make sure that the uh, display area is set um, so I've got, you know, I'm seeing all the points in my display area, so I can just export that study area. Um, if you needed to, if you had a larger data set and you needed to clip it, right, we have an option here to do that where you can draw an area that you want to download. Choose your data format. In this case, uh, I'll just stick with CSV. It would give it a nice output name. And then once it's uh, extracted, I can, you know, browse to that item in my content and download it and I'll get output that looks like this, right? So here's those 18 points um, with all the accompanying information that I can include in my report. So uh, we walked through a few of the tools. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Stuart, to walk through a few more of these. Again, we won't touch on every single tool, but we have a few more interesting scenarios to show you. So take it away, Stuart. Thanks, Bonnie. So as my colleague noted, spatial analysis allows us to solve complex location-oriented problems and better understand the world around us. And over the course of the next five demos, we'll ask questions of our data and see how best we can answer that. So through the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, it's closed schools all across the United States, including in our nation's capital. And schools serve a vital role in our community, not only educating, but also delivering meals to children. Sometimes these are the only places children in at-risk groups can get a meal during the day. The city of Washington, D.C. approached us and asked us to find where children may be most at risk of missing out on these critical meals. And the city wants to know where those areas are so they can better deploy their resources to meet the needs of these at-risk communities. So we're first gonna need an area to investigate. Using Esri's Living Atlas, we can add USA Census tracts to our map, which I've gone ahead and added. And this will provide us a structure for our analysis. But if I investigate this attribute table, I, I see there's nothing really here to analyze or symbolize. So that's where I'm gonna use the analysis toolbox. Using the analysis toolbox, I'll come into the data enrichment and I'll find the enrich layer tool, which will allow me to add variables to my map. Uh, and I'll be able to choose the layer that I wanna use. And as Bonnie noted, uh, I can choose any layer, uh, even if it's not in the map. So in the living atlas or in my organization. But for the purposes of this analysis, we'll use the USA census tracks and then I'll have the ability to go ahead and select my variables. And when I come into my data browser, there's a whole host of categories and options for me to choose from, but I wanna investigate the at-risk variables. And when I dig down into a category, it's gonna give me the three most popular ones, but I wanna show all at-risk variables. And when I come into this data browser, I see that there are 64 different categories, but 
I only want three. I want children under the age of 14. I want the average household income, and then I'll select my key demographic indicators and select total population. And these three variables are going to allow me to start to solve and answer the question that the city of Washington, D.C. has asked me. So I'll go ahead and apply those. I'll leave this parameter alone, and I'll make sure that use current map extent as checked so I don't enrich every single census tract in Washington or throughout the United States. And I can also check my credits. And once I've checked this credit usage report, I can go ahead and run this analysis. And now that we investigated the attribute table for the unenriched layer, let's turn that layer off, turn our enriched new layer, which has been added to our map, and investigate that attribute table. When we investigate this attribute table, we can see that three new attributes have been added, which are going to help us answer these questions that we need to answer. So when we see that we have the average household income and children under the age of 14, we can go ahead and start answering those questions. And we don't have to run another analysis. We can begin to symbolize using those two new added attributes. And now that we've gone ahead and added them, we can cancel and we can go ahead and see that we've added our symbology already to the map. And now that we have this, we can go ahead and investigate a specific area within our map to show uh, what exactly is happening within that area. And selecting these pop-ups, we see that there are 748 children in this specific census tract and the median household income is only $24,000. So maybe the city of Washington, D.C. should be deploying food resources to this area of D.C. to make sure that children in this area have the food they need to grow and to continue to learn and that they don't go hungry during this incredibly difficult time for the nation and for the children in impoverished areas. And now that we've gone ahead and symbolized this map, we can share this, we can save it, we can go ahead and share it as a web app, whether that's a story map or a dashboard, or in this case, a web app. And web applications created with Web App Builder for ArcGIS, they're powerful GIS applications that you can create without writing a single line of code. This specific web app is using the analysis widget. And the analysis widget allows me to incorporate different tools that you find in the spatial analysis toolbox toolbox and ArcGIS online. And it's going to allow me to accomplish uh, a lot of the workflows that I just showed. So you can share this app out and people can begin to enrich their layer with the same type of variables that I just did. And I can choose any variable I want to. It's the same interface that was in my ArcGIS online spatial analysis toolbox. So I can add different health indicators or different spending habits across my study area. And once I exit out of that and I've added new attributes to visualize, I can use the other tool that I've included, which we're gonna learn a little bit more about next, the Find Hotspots tool, to find statistically significant spatial clustering in my data. And that leads me right into our next demo where we're gonna start to investigate uh, hotspots of Medicare spending throughout the United States. So the Department of Health and Human Services have tasked us with finding areas of the country where our Medicare money, our Medicare dollars being spent. We'll once again need structure for our analysis and we'll return to the Living Atlas Lit to add hospital referral regions, which will provide us the backbone for our analysis. And I can go ahead and since I've added that layer, I can turn it on and I've also visualized this layer based off standardized risk adjusted per capita cost of Medicare, which is going to give me a good overall view of Medicare spending in the United States. And this risk adjusted uh, per capita cost is the cost of Medicare procedures adjusted to reflect all beneficiaries. So it's a really good attribute that's going to allow me to conduct a thorough analysis. So using to find the hotspot tool, I'll come into my spatial analysis toolbox. I'll select analyze patterns and I'll find the hotspots. And as Bonnie noted, I can take a look at this information bubble or this help bubble that's going to allow me to see what this tool exactly does. So if I'm ever unsure, 
I can click on this information pop out and it's going to tell me exactly what the tool does, which is just going to help me along and conduct better analysis. So using the Find Hotspots tool, I'll be able to select the layer I want to run my hotspots on, which will be my hospital referral regions, and then it's going to allow me to select the variable. And we've already decided that the standardized risk adjusted per capita cost variable is the one we're going to use, and it's right there. We're going to leave this parameter blank, we'll give it a name, and we'll go ahead and run this analysis. And since this analysis is already here, we'll select that and we'll expand that. And now, with just a visual investigation of our map, we can see that there are statistically significant clustering of Medicare spending throughout the South, along the Mississippi River, River through the Midwest. And also, we can find that there are cold spots of Medicare spending throughout the Northwest, the Upper Midwest, the Northeast, and along the Californian coast. So we've been able to answer a question regarding Medicare spending with one tool and one layer from the Living Atlas. That makes the spatial analysis and uh, the spatial analysis tools in ArcGIS Online powerful and allows us to continue to answer these location-oriented problems. And we've now used a couple tools to answer singular questions. Well, let's answer a few more, let's use a few more spatial analysis tools to answer multiple questions. So the police chief in Lincoln, Nebraska, they have a few questions for us. They wanna know what's going on in their city. Their first question is, is where, where are crimes happening? in relation to their police station and how quickly can officers respond? The police chief wants five minutes or less. He wants his officers to be quick. How many crimes are happening within that specific five minute area? And finally, he wants to know which station is most likely to respond to each incident. And lucky for us, using the spatial analysis tool toolbox, we can answer all of these questions. So the first question we're gonna answer, we're gonna use the use proximity tool and the create drive time areas. For our first parameter, we're gonna make sure that we choose station uh, stations because that's gonna be the layer that the drive time area is gonna be generated around. We're gonna select drive time. And as Bonnie noted, you can select other options from this, but we want our officers driving and we want them responding as quickly as possible. And we're gonna keep the five minutes because that's what the police chief wants. He wants his officers responding in five minutes. We could use traffic and specify a day, but we'll leave that blank for now. We'll select away from facility, and we'll also select dissolve, which is gonna create one nice continuous polygon around our police stations. We'll give it a name, and we'll select run analysis. When we run that analysis, a polygon is gonna be added to our map, which is gonna show us a five minute drive time around each police station. And it's gonna show us visually what crimes can be reached within that five minutes. But when we investigate the attribute table, it doesn't tell us how many crimes are happening in within that five minute area. We'll once again, come back into our spatial analysis uh, toolbox. We'll use the summarize data, and we'll use the aggregate points to quickly surmise how many crimes have happened within this polygon or within this five minute drive time. So our first parameter, uh, the points to aggregate, we wanna know how many crimes are happening. We'll add crimes. We'll choose the polygon layer, which will be our five minutes away from the police station. It'll be our five minute drive time. And we'll go ahead and leave these parameters blank and we'll click run analysis. And when we run it, the analysis, that too will be added to our map and we'll be able to quickly identify through this outline of the polygon and the red dot dropped in the middle, how many crimes have happened within this five minute drive time. And we immediately know that 840 crimes have happened within five minutes or a five minute drive time of these police stations. But we're not done yet. We still have one more question to answer. The police chief wants to know what stations are responding to which crime. So once again, we'll use our uh, analysis toolbox, and we'll use the find locations toolbox and open our choose best facilities tool. And the choose best facilities tool is going to give us a couple options to use. For the purposes of this analysis, we'll use the maximize coverage tool. And we'll once again be using our drive time because we want our officers driving. We'll do facility to demand. We can select which day of the week, we can select the time. 
We can also select our demand location layer. And this is where it can get a little bit tricky for a second. So our demand location layer is going to be our crimes. That's where when a crime happens, that's where the demand is needed. That's where we need to be. And our helpful little tips under the box shows us, or under the parameter shows us that we have 1,025 demand locations. Uh, and that's, we have 1,025 crimes to respond to. And we're gonna go ahead and leave these other parameters blank. And our candidate facility layer, these are going to be the, uh, the, the police stations, the stations that'll be responding to these crimes. It shows us that we have 11. So we need to make sure that we maximize the coverage of our police station. So we're gonna need to change this to 11 as well so that we use every single police station to respond to every single crime. Once I've, once I've made sure these parameters are correct, I can go ahead and hit run analysis. And that's gonna generate three new layers in my map. And it's gonna show me the allocation lines from each police station. It's gonna show me the crimes highlighted but I'll go ahead and turn that off. And it's gonna show me the facilities selected as well. And this is gonna allow me to quickly visualize and see which stations are most likely to respond to which crime and what crimes are falling outside of that five minute drive time and how and which police station is going to respond. And one of the things that my eye is first drawn to is in the Northwest of Lincoln, we can see that there are crimes that are signif a significant distance away from these police stations near the airport. And if I were to select this and examine the pop-up, I can see that it takes police officers almost 11 minutes to respond to crimes out by the airport and that there are uh, 10, 12, 15 crimes occurring in this area. So now I've answered three questions that the police chief has asked me to, but I can also go back with a proposal saying, uh, sir, if you want these, if you want your response time to be five minutes or less, we may need to station an officer out by the airport or put in a new station or an area where, so that we can respond in the fashion that you want us to. For our final example, we'll head to South Beach in warm Florida sunshine to assist the Florida Department of Labor to deploy their staff in the most efficient way possible. The Florida Department of Labor is conducting their annual spot check of Miami contractors to ensure their compliance with labor law. They have five investigators to inspect 34 contractors tomorrow. They wanna to know how can they best deploy their workforce. Using the spatial analysis toolbox, we can answer this question. We can help them deploy their workforce in the most efficient way possible. We'll use the use proximity toolbox and we'll select plan routes. And the plan routes tool has about nine parameters. So we'll walk through these one by one. So the first, the first choose point layer representing stops to visit is that's going to be our contractors. Those are gonna be the stops that our investigators are going to visit. And for travel mode, we'll once again have our investigators driving. And uh, so our routes begin at our, when they say routes begin at stops, that's gonna be our field offices. That's where our investigators are gonna start and that's where they're gonna end their day when they come back to the office to put their report in. And we can also select a date and time for this. So they're gonna get a nice early start on Friday and they're gonna start at 9 a.m. And they're, we're gonna make sure that when we conduct this analysis, we're gonna add points to the map to visualize uh, what stops they're going to be making. They're gonna be in five vehicles for our five investigators. And since there's about, there's 34 stops and we have five investigators, we'll make the maximum number of stops seven. And this will allow us to choose how many minutes or how much time is spent at each stop. So we'll say about half an hour to conduct these spot checks. Now that, and it's gonna take, it's gonna be an eight hour day. It's gonna be a typical work day. We'll hit run analysis. When we come back, this will populate two new layers in our map, which will show each individual route and show each individual stop for each investigator. And selecting the pop-up, we can see that our, our investigator, Sue Parker, she has seven stops to make. And it's 75 minutes is about the total time um, that she's gonna need. And that's gonna allow us to best deploy our workforce and be most efficient. And that type of analysis and type of power is only going to make 
uh, and the ease that we can conduct this analysis is only going to help organizations uh, answer complex questions. And we've now gone through about five demos showing how spatial analysis can answer a variety of different questions in different situations. And I'm now going to turn it back over to Bonnie and let her um, let her take uh, control of the meeting again. Great, thank you, Stuart. Show my screen again here. All right, so just to wrap up, I wanted to provide a quick summary of what we've talked about today. Um, hopefully you've gotten the message that spatial analysis adds uh, tremendous valuable insights to, uh, to your work by providing these tools that let you answer questions about your data. And ArcGIS Online is providing these tools in a hosted environment and they're grouped into categories in an easy to use interface uh, to make it easy for you to understand when to apply them. And finally, performing spatial analysis online follows this common workflow of preparing your data, adding that to the map, running your analysis, reviewing those results, and then optionally rerunning your analysis to sort of iterate on your question. Uh, so we wanted to leave you with a few resources. That would be uh, our documentation. So hopefully if you've never looked at our uh, ArcGIS Online documentation uh, before, this is a good place to start with the um, analysis tools. Um, this will give you kind of an overview of um, you know, the, the way you interact with the tools. And then for each tool, you can um, read more specifically about it. Uh, for some of them, you will um, encounter limitations on the amount of data that you can use or n number of inputs and things like that. So those are important um, things to be able to look up in this documentation. Um, we also want to point you to some learn lessons if you want to, uh, you know, just get some more practice learn, uh, working with these tools. This uh, learn.arcgis.com pathway on uh, data analysis will um, walk you through more of these types of scenarios and using the online analysis tools. And then finally, if you just want to understand more about um, analysis or with GIS um, in general, there's an analysis case studies document um, to browse through, you know, how other, how other organizations and other users out there have been applying analysis um, to solve problems in their organizations. So um, with that, uh, thank you everyone for joining today. We have some time left to answer some more questions. Uh, so, Margie, I believe if you want to pass any on to us. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for handling the questions in the chat. Um, we really just have one that I think would be great for the group to hear. Um, is that five minute drive time based on street speed limits? Sure, I'll take this one if you want. Um, so thanks for the question. Yes, so uh, when you specify a transportation network in any of those tools, um, by default, it's going to use whatever speed limit is uh, built into the street network data set, right? So, um, you know, that's the data that's kind of, uh, you know, statically built into the street network um, from our data sources that we build our, our network off of. Uh, but uh, many of those tools will then present you with the option to use live traffic. So if you want to take the, you know, average traffic conditions into account in your analysis, um, there are options to do that. So you could specify a date and time of when people would be traveling to take that into account um, that leverages our, our kind of world traffic service um, and incorporates data from that um, to help refine and, and make that analysis a little bit more accurate rather than just basing it on the, on the um, speed limit. But if you choose not to use that live traffic parameter, then yes, it's just gonna go based off of the, the speed limit. So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Bonnie and Stuart. Uh, and with that, we'll wrap up the webinar. Thanks everyone for attending and we'll send out the slides and the um, video once it's ready. Thanks again and have a great day.